With me in studio is Georg Holm from Sigur Rós, a most unusual and unique band formed in Iceland in 1994. Georg, welcome. Thank you. Iceland is a most amazing place. Now, I've not spent any time there. I had a layover once in Reykjavik, and I thought, wow, this is unusual. Even the airport gives you a very different sort of sensibility. And it's frequently referred to as the land of fire and ice because glaciers and volcanoes sort of coexist in this relatively small island about the size of Ohio. And there's maybe a quarter of a million people, half of which live in Reykjavik. I would imagine you get to know a lot of people in, in your hometown of Reykjavik. Is that true? Yeah, yeah, that's true. I mean, Are there a lot of bands? Is there a lot of music going on in Reykjavik these days? Um, yeah, I think uh, ever since... Well, yeah, I think, I think it kind of started when I was young. When you know, every every kid in Iceland would be starting a band, forming a band to, start, to play some instrument, um, and it's still going on now. I think there's, there's so many bands. Did a little research on Iceland. One of the things that I found really interesting was that the language Icelandic has remained essentially unchanged for a thousand years, and that's very rare around the world. And they say that in biology, creatures that have become perfect no longer evolve. They don't need to adapt anymore, right? Like the possum or the shark. Icelandic. Maybe it's the perfect language. <laughs> it probably is. <laughs> Speaking of language, when I listen to your albums, this is, I suppose, your third full-length proper album, the Untitled album that just hit the United States six months ago or so. I compare philosophically, anyway, Sigurós's lyrical content to scat singing, to jazz singing. And let me clarify that. It seems to me it's more about the sound of the voice than the meaning of the words. Yeah, true. Yeah, I, th yeah, I, I think I agree. I think it's, um, yeah, I mean, it, it, I, th I think the voice can, can s say a lot of things without actually using real words to describe them, uh, as music can as well, I think. You know, it does yeah. the same thing. Does Sigurós sing in Icelandic? Sounds like it's Icelandic, but also just sort of tones and almost babble incantation, or maybe a combination of both. Um, well, on a, on the last record, uh, I'll get this period, the blue one. Uh, um, it was all in Icelandic. I see. Except one track, but um, the new one is, is is all done in just it's just babble. There are no real words on it. Just singing. Yeah. The sound of the voice. Yeah. How does Sigurós compose music? Describe the process of, is there a primary songwriter, or is it purely collaborative effort? How does it happen for Sigur Rós? It's, it's, a, it's a very natural process. It's basically just us plugging our instruments in and starting to play. It's just jamming. Yeah. And then, you know, we figure it out later. Is the recording process like that as well? Maybe a little more refined, have a better idea of where you're going, and then you kind of open up? Or Yeah, I mean, normally we do things the wrong way around. Well, the wrong way around for other bands, maybe, but for us it seems to be the right way around. Um, uh, we normally jam the songs, then we start playing them live, uh, and we tour around with the songs, and we, we keep on writing the songs while we're touring. Um, so, we, I mean, quite often we're playing songs that aren't even finished. We're just playing a version of it. Right. Um, like we're doing now. And then, at some point, we'll say, "Okay, this this is this might be the way it should be." And then, when we record it, we might even change it again. Yeah, I would imagine that if you were to re-record your three albums, including the untitled parentheses album, it might sound completely different. It probably w would. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Speaking of recording, Stax Records, that made all those great soul records in the 1960s, was famous for its studio. It was an old movie theater. And it gave those records a very specific sound. I read that Alafos, your recording studio, actually is a converted swimming pool. Is that true? Yes. How do you suppose that contributed to the sound of the album? I mean, I you think know. sound in a swimming pool, you think echo. And I'm wondering if that yeah. kind of reverberation is felt in the dynamic of Sigurosa's sound. It's, it's not a very big swimming pool, though. Um, and it doesn't have the, the tiled swimming pool, basically. It's just like a... It looks almost like a one big box, but so I mean, there's, there's not a very long reverb in that room. It's, I see. it's quite short. But uh, we decided when we when we built it, instead of getting these experts in and, and you know trying to make the sound of the room, we decided to just leave it as it is, just to to use the sound of the real sound of the room instead of ruining it, basically. Right. Will you record there again? Uh, yeah, 
I think so. Yeah. If music for you is artistically successful, what does that mean? Um, I don't know. Let's scrap that. Move on. <laughs> <laughs> Edit point. A ten. Click. <laughs> um, what's what's the most unusual musical instrument, or for that matter, object that you've used to create sound, whether it's on your records or on the stage? Um, well, you, you just made me think of something actually <laughs> quite funny. Um, we we did this. Um, we did a did seventy min- minutes of music to a to an old Icelandic poem that was in the, the Eddas, um, uh, which which had been taken out. It's, it was called Odin's Raven Magic, basically. Um, uh, we pl- we played it twice, once in London and and once in Reykjavik with a full string orchestra and a choir and and this um, is a marimba made out of Icelandic stones. Huh. Very in- interesting instrument, but that was not uh, the most interesting instrument, uh, you know, that that we were going to use. We found these horns, these very very strange horns, um, really odd shaped, very strange sound, and I'm, I've never seen them before. I never, you know, I never seen them again. Yeah. Uh, I think these were made in Germany, like 1910 or something, and they only made a few, and they never really caught on these instruments. And we found one, uh, two or three of them in a, in a school in Iceland, a music school. Hmm. They, they would just hang on the wall. Right. And we decided to borrow them and use it for, for, the, for the whole climax of, of, the, of the, the score that we were doing. Because they had this very distinctive noise. What would they look um, like? Do you remember? Uh, th- they were all different. But yeah. they were all strange. Huh. <laughs> very strange looking. But what we did, we, we borrowed one of these air pumps electrical air pumps connected <laughs> <laughs> to the horns yeah. and just you know put it up to 10 right. and they made the most horrible noise I've ever heard in my life and you guys are probably like that's great we need to use that <laughs> yeah yeah it was it, it was really funny it was a good you know it was a funny experiment but we decided to scrap it yeah are you drawn to things like that unusual objects instruments that kind of thing or do you prefer the keyboards and the voice and the guitars and drums and so forth um, um, anything goes. I think. Yeah, you know, we, we are interested in different instruments, but we also like using the normal instruments, maybe differently. Yeah, you know? um, like a bow with an electric guitar, yeah. a la Jimmy Page, that kind of thing. Yeah, whatever works, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. I'm wondering about your live act because it seems to me that Sigaros would almost be perfect in a cathedral. I mean, I would love to hear Sigaros like in the National Cathedral in D.C. So actually, let's scrap the 9.30 performance and go to the cathedral. (laughs) I I think the kind of resonance that you would get in such a huge structure, any cathedral, I think would be really kind of phenomenal. But um, I'm wondering about your your live performances. How structured are they? You mentioned improvisation is very important. The song itself simply a point of departure for you, and then it just kind of opens up according to how you all are feeling that night? Or do you have sort of an idea, a roadmap? How does it work for you? No, I mean, the the, the songs are written in a way, but... Quite often it just depends on our mood, you know, if the song is going to turn out good live or not. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know. It's, there's always room for some improvisation live. Yeah. Um, but, it, I mean, it's, it's, it's also just rock and roll. Yeah. Know? So, I mean, even though it, it sounds different and all that, it's, it, 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 it can be rock and roll as well. So. You've been to the States a couple of times now, yes? A few times, yeah. A few times, yeah. yeah. Where did your English? You must have studied it. No. No? No, I picked it up from TV. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> what are your impressions of the United States? They are up and down, and it just depends on where I am and who I meet. It's such a huge country. It's every every time I get off the bus, it's different. You know, It's, like, it's almost like touring in Europe, because... You get off the bus in another country every day. Yeah. But here, it's almost the same. You're getting off the bus in another country every day. That's interesting. Georg Holm of Sigur Ros, thanks so much for stopping by and spending a few minutes with us. Thank you very much.